time for you to go through this particular webinar. Um, we have a, a format here, which you can see in front of you. I'm gonna cover off some of the basics, but for people sort of familiar with the structure uh, of webinars that we tend to do, um, we tend to break them up into sort of two halves. And the first half is actually going through a lot of the, uh, sometimes some of the technical considerations, some of the concepts and points that we think are important for people to understand. And then generally the second part of it is we jump right into Privacy Engine and show you what that actually looks like in practice. And there's a lot to consider here uh, in terms of how to implement uh, records processing activity. Um, we have uh, had the benefit of, uh, I suppose, even engaging with the commissioner's office on this to some extent. Um, uh, people, I know there's a lot on this webinar at the moment, which is great. Just looking up the attendee list there, uh, strong contingency from Ireland, but. Uh, very much an international audience, but for our Irish um, uh, listeners, uh, they would be familiar that the Commissioner's Office here in, in Ireland kicked off an initiative or a campaign around records processing activity um, a, little, a couple of months ago, I think it was at this point, and I think they're, they're approaching the end of that now, and uh, they're due to have some guidelines on that, uh, I, I think within the next month or so, but we have um, had conversations with them uh, about this and we'll be able to tell you a little bit about what is in that as well. So I'll structure that into the actual webinar at the right time um, uh, that, that'll be relevant to the, to the points we're, we're trying to make as well. So uh, breaking news in that sense in terms of uh, some of the information you'll be able to get through. Just for people who aren't familiar with who we are, we are a privacy management uh, platform company. Obviously we do consultancy around the platform growing quite fast uh, at this point, global uh, audience, and um, a lot of users using the platform as well, over 40,000, I think it's approaching 50,000 now actually, which is which is great, I think we're well on that slide. Um, I will uh, speak a little bit about this one, however, and this is sort of the very sort of clean summation of the sort of state of play where we are, and the reason for this being, uh, particularly rope is being so important uh, at this time. Um, the whole reason we're, we're all here is the fact that we've had this explosion of personal data has led to this massive increase in regulation. And the latest Gartner report on this, which they do update this every, one, every uh, year or so, is that about 75% of the global population will be under uh, what they call GDPR-like, or, or they've started using the term modern privacy laws by 2023. Uh, so that that's uh, when you consider it was 10% in 2018. So the rate of change here has continued to um, continue to uh, increase in terms of from a legislative perspective, which of course creates a lot of privacy teams and creates a lot of uh, challenges for companies to demonstrate compliance. And I think this is really one of the areas that is uh, very relevant to today's conversation in terms of records of processing activity. The ROPAs themselves are a great way for organizations to start that process of demonstrating compliance with particularly obviously the GDPR GDPR is, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, basically um, 99 articles in the GDPR and over 30 of them actually refer to the obligation to demonstrate to comply, demonstrate compliance with the regulation. So the rope has actually really do factor in, in on that. Just a quick question, I'll just cover off um, changes to, to the UK government recent announcements to move away uh, from the need to maintain. This is very much a, a, a moving moving sort of piece. So we have our eyes firmly focused on um, what's happened in the UK. The one thing I would make, the observation that I would, would, would say here is that for organizations that are in the UK that actually plan on doing business outside of Europe, uh, it actually to a certain degree can become a moot point. Uh, we see this with a lot of organizations, uh, even in uh, the US, for example, who are looking to um, do a lot of business in a European uh, context and actually choose to go down the path of actually um, complying with the actual regulation. But we can come on to that uh, maybe later on in the, in the Q&A sections as well. Needless to say, the ROPAs are, are really uh, important in, in one really cr uh, key critical way of demonstrating compliance is to have a very effective ROPA uh, functionality uh, or program in place to cover off the very basics here. It's Article 30 of the GDPR. But a question, I suppose it was re related to the question we just received there uh, a moment ago in terms of who is required to do the, the actually complete the records of processing activity. So the letter of the law does say that uh, 
if you uh, have more than 250 um, employees then you need to do one however i would stress that um the completing the records of processing activity within an organization uh, is uh, one of the critical steps in many ways in demonstrating compliance and it actually creates the framework for which an organization can document how they process personal capability i would make the distinction that um, this 250 number as well relates to the obligation to complete the ROPAs. It doesn't necessarily relate to the ob obligation to actually demonstrate compliance. So in that sense, uh, you know, most organizations would have uh, or would be strongly recommended to actually have uh, the ROPAs completed as well. Uh, just to call that one out straight, straight away. Um, I'm going to actually go through what I think, uh, and this, it, it, it may surprise people to start it in this way, but I think it can be quite useful when we are having a conversation around what does good look like. Sometimes it's helpful just to take a step back and understand what not to do. And the reason I'm going to start here is that this is very often where we see uh, most companies in terms of their maturity or capability with respect to records of processing activity. It'd be quite common for us to go into an organization and that they would have uh, the rope is completed to a certain standard but it would be in Excel. Um, we uh, would have quite strong views in Privacy Engine around not doing it this way. Um, there is a couple of very good reasons for that. And these will become more evident really as we go through what good looks like. And you'll see why you can't actually necessarily do this to a certain degree in, in Excel on its own. First of all, there's a lot of duplication in Excel. If we are trying to map uh, the processes into a structure that actually accurately reflects our business so or, or any organization's business. Uh, it's hard to have it in such a linear format. There, there's generally an aggregation of records of processing activity that makes sense, that make uh, the actual rope as intelligible. Uh, a lot of the time, if they're just dumped into an Excel sheet, it can be very difficult to try and provide context around what we're looking at. Uh, and it re can require a lot of duplication in roles. Just to jump to one of the points here, just from my notes, when we were speaking to the commissioner's office about this, one of the first things that they said in relation to the ROPAs that they actually seen was that a lot of them were not easy to understand. And more often than not, this is because you're getting them in a sort of an Excel dump. There's no immediate context provided in terms of what they're actually looking at. So again, hard to do that in Excel. Uh, and actually come up with a, a, a coherent rope program that actually is easy to understand quickly, uh, particularly if it's been reviewed by the commissioner's office. Also, you know, with, with Excel, you don't get any, you get really limited impact analysis, but you don't really get any feel for where the risks are. They, you, all you're really doing is documenting it. When you're using a platform, such as Privacy Engine, for example, to be able to report back to you as you start to complete the record of processing activity, where the risks are that are associated with how you're processing it. And that's a very, very powerful thing to be able to do, particularly when you consider the amount of guidelines that come out from the European Data Protection Board and the, and the DPC, uh, and of course, everything that just happens in, in real time in the privacy world, being able to actually have an accurate, kept up-to-date view of where the risks are associated with these records of processing activity is, is, is very, very useful to be able to do as well. Excel doesn't lend itself to project management, and it certainly doesn't lend itself to capturing the underlying structure of the data. Uh, and again, I, I will show you exactly what I mean by that when, when I go through it, but just to call this out again, right from the get-go, as in terms of what, what we think not to do, I think it's helpful to have a look at this so that we can understand what, what not to do in many, in many situations. Okay, so the people involved in, in actually competing, completing the records of processing activity is also really quite, um, quite, quite critical. Okay, so what we're always trying to do here is we're trying to map on one hand the data protection, legal uh, and regulatory obligations, we're trying to map that to how we're actually processing the data within each of our respective areas. So that actually requires us to involve uh, different people within the organization. We would call these individuals data protection champions, but they could be a head of, uh, head of a department uh, or it could be a, a, a staff member who understands intimately how a specific process works. 
and it's going to have to be them to describe what it is they're doing. And we need to map that to the regulatory obligations as well. So it is a multidisciplinary sort of project in many respects. And we try and again map what, what individuals know about how, in, how organizations process personal data with the actual requirements as well. So the DPO in and of themselves can't really complete this on their own. They're going to need the help of the wider team as well. And that's an important point. So when we're filling this out, again, one of the disadvantages of let's say using Excel is that more often than not, the actual data protection champion in this case, or the person filling it out, has to almost guess what they're actually trying to do. So we want is to create a process that's easy to use, where they can almost select the options that are that are <clears throat> that, that are available to them under the context that we want to provide and that we actually can offer them assistance and support and actually how to fill that out. So making it easy for, for individuals and organizations to fill it out is really quite a, a, an important aspect in making it um, making the process actually uh, smooth in and of itself. So just stepping back to the structure of it as well again, um, the, the structure of uh, Europas I think is really quite key. We want to take a top-down approach. So we don't, we don't necessarily want to try and do everything in one go because very often that can uh, be a barrier to even getting started in many situations. The best approach that we find works, and again, this is dealing with uh, probably thousands of companies at this point uh, over the last decade in terms of, well, not decades with regards to Europas, but uh, in terms of helping organizations structure these, it's helpful to break it up into bite-sized pieces. And it's also helpful to create a hierarchy of these actual processes. So in this very sort of simple illustration, what we're saying is that you have a HR department in most organizations. Within HR, there might be an appraisal process, a recruitment process, there might be a training process that you see in front of you now. And then within the training process, there might be two distinct processes that you might have in terms of training marketing staff, and training, let's say, outsourced developers. And again, we're just picking examples here to illustrate the concepts, but there's this hierarchy built in. Now that's very, very useful to be able to do because one, it provides a framework and a context for how we would actually go about doing this in a way that is easy to understand. The other key benefit of doing this, going back to some of the guidelines that will be coming out from the DPC, is that it provides someone looking at this and reviewing the document instant context as to what they're actually looking at. So if they're looking at training marketing staff, they can see where it sits within the ROPA framework, if you like, within the ROPA process, and they can see that it sits quite clearly within the HR processes as well. So breaking it up into bite-sized manageable pieces that we can then delegate out to uh, DP champions uh, is very much the recommended approach here, top-down rather than a flat structure just describing all of the processes in one sort of table. So we want to avoid that. It provides us immediate context. The other thing that we notice uh, as well is that um, when we are describing uh, the ROPAs, and this leads into some of the benefits of actually having ROPAs as part of your privacy program, um, there are what we would call one-to-many relationships. Uh, now, um, to look at one example here, uh, we picked off one sort of record of processing activity, the training of, let's say, training of marketing staff. They, in the context of doing that, may there may be multiple policies associated with that record of processing activity. There may be multiple third parties involved in that, multiple IT systems. Uh, there might be multiple acquisition methods. And of course, there would be several risks involved with actually this particular process. And this particular processor could, for each risk that we identify, there might be several actions just to amplify the actual pro problem as well. Now, there's both a benefit to this. This is reality for most organizations. There's a, there's a benefit to this structure as much as there is a challenge to this structure. The challenge is that it makes it very, very difficult to do in Excel. But the benefit of this is that you're actually building up your list of third parties as you go and complete your records of processing activity. You're building, you're getting a profile of what your risks are. You're identifying your acquisition methods as you start to build this up and you're identifying where perhaps you may not have provided fair notice or you're identifying your IT systems. So having this sort of, these, these sort of dual considerations, the hierarchy of how you want to actually structure your ROPAs and then this one-to-many relationship between uh, the uh, constituents or the components of what you're doing within a ROPA and how that sort of leads into the other areas of your privacy management 
program, by building up your IT systems, your third parties is, is actually very useful. Once we actually get this done in a way, and again, making it easy to use, then it becomes a very powerful tool in terms of understanding uh, the structure of how you process personal data within the organization. It makes it easier or lends itself to uh, uh, easily slicing and dicing the data, which I'll show you on the platform once we actually get into that more in more detail. So again, I mean, the, the topic of this conversation is how the rope is our cornerstone to a privacy program. And I'm just gonna point out a couple of areas for where that is very much the case. So as we go through the records of processing activity, we will be identifying legal basis um, for processing information. Although it's not necessarily mandatory uh, within Europa, it is very much recommended that we include the legal basis for where we're processing information. We will be able to, if we, if we do this correctly, pick up uh, where we have, uh, we have a need for a legitimate interest assessment. And as I mentioned previously, we, we will pick up all third parties that are involved in the processing of the activity that we're actually looking at. Um, again, retention as well in terms of which, um, when we are processing information uh, relating to uh, any particular uh, record of processing activity, we will come across the need to uh, clarify what the retention periods are for information that we're actually capturing. And that, of course, um, particularly when we, when we actually look at records of processing activity uh, categorized in this hierarchy, we may identify the need for DPIAs. Now, of course, this generally applies to new projects, but because we'll have them clustered, we might be able to identify and really will be able to identify uh, where there are clusters of processing that may require uh, more of a deep dive assessment, or if they're proposed processes, uh, where does a DPIA? The other thing I'll just make as a sort of as a sort of buy to buy point that privacy engine customers will, will be familiar with is that where we enter information into the platform, we really want to get the benefit of that later on. So when we actually have completed a record of processing activity, that actually feeds into our DPIA process. So for those familiar with that, which of course is a separate webinar, we will it, uh, we will um, guide people into actually identifying the records that are associated with the with the process that's being proposed and whether there's actually new records of processing activity required or not. So the information is is very very usable, very very re, very reusable throughout the entire platform when we're looking at it from a privacy engine. But we should look at that in terms of DPAs. We will of course identify international transfers when we go through the records of processing activity. Um, and of course, uh, things like special category data, any technical controls, we start to build up a log of our IT systems uh, and indeed any organizational controls or security controls relating to those IT systems as well. So we'll start to get a view of all of this as we, as we build up the actual privacy, uh, uh, the records of processing activity, we start to get a view of our privacy program. Okay, so that's a kind of very high level skip through. Let me just do a quick check on the time. Okay, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually switch over onto the platform and I'm gonna ground a lot of what I just said there, hopefully with some very practical sort of walkthroughs in terms of where this is applicable and how you would actually go about this within uh, something like Privacy Engine. So bear with me while I switch over to uh, my other screen. Okay, now, uh, hopefully everybody can see my screen now. So uh, for people that are familiar with Privacy Engine, you'll see on this logged on as a, as a DP lead or DPO, and I'm on the homepage. Record of processing activity is, is down here. You can also navigate to it by actually going and clicking here. I'll just click right in. So when we actually go here, you'll, the first thing you'll see is that um, we've got this very simple view. And this simple view is basically a, 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 a record uh, with a description and the suggested risk, open risks and closed lists. Now on the slides that I had, I had a structure where I had a HR department, I had training of staff, and I, in, under that I had two other processes, training of marketing staff and training of developers. Uh, again, going back to, to this type of structure and why this is so important, it does make it so much easier for organizations that have multiple records of processing uh, logs to actually identify where it sits within the context of order logs, within the context of your organization, when we apply this hierarchy structure. I think it does, going back to one of the observations from the commissioner's office in terms of being able to understand uh, the records of processing activity much more easily 
having it in this structure really, really helps. Um, what I will do is I'll drill down into one of these records and I'll, I'll walk through uh, just uh, some of the um, some of the, the, the pieces of information that we actually want to capture here. So I'll drill down into maybe this one here. Um, clicking on it, by the way, really quickly, will just bring up these sort of high level uh, tasks here, but I'm gonna go straight and drill down into the activity itself. Now, when we actually uh, drill down into it, um, there are a lot of pieces of information that we would want to capture uh, in relation to any record or processing activity. Now, keep in mind, uh, there will be people filling this out that are not data protection experts. And that's really important because we want people filling this out to understand how the processing works, what's involved within each particular process. And then we want the system as best as it can to actually generate or propose risk based on how individual records of processing activities are completed by DP champions as well. Just as a bit of a side note, we are actually uh, updating the look and feel of these particular screens at the moment. We are adding a couple of new fields as well. I'll just mention them before I, I forget as I go through this. We're, we're introducing a new status field, which is required for the integration with DPIA, so I'll briefly talk about. We're introducing a new tags field we're also introducing a review date and the review date will uh, nudge the DP champion or the DPO to actually have a look at this or review this roadmap after a certain time. And that's actually going to feed into our program of work functionality, which is, which is also being deployed later this year as well. But going through it as it is today, uh, we do keep some high level information, training the staff, it's the name of this. We have some uh, activity description of what this activity is. We want to specify what jurisdiction it is. We also want to specify other jurisdictions uh, where the processing activity takes place. So, for example, if I click on this, um, there may be other areas that I want to, to select that actually uh, processes as well. Again, we want to select or we want to determine um, what uh, the individual is for this processing. So, for this processing activity, we are a data controller, data processor, and so on. And you'll notice, for example, that there are uh, helps uh, sort of indicators pretty much on, on, on most things so that if a DP champion is filling this out, they would be able to understand what it is. The other aspect that I would also recommend is you'll see down here, big red button. I mean, we've, we've been doing this for so long at this point. We know, that the, we know the challenge it is for some DP champions to fill this out when they're not DP experts. So if there is a question, they can actually just click on this at any point and gets immediate clarification from one of our data protection specialists. That's not a um, that's not a bot or anything like that. That's an actual individual that they will be able to um, uh, get some uh, clarification from as well. It's very very useful in the event that that's required. Uh, we want to describe the purpose of the processing. We try to limit the amount of free text elements here. Now the reason for that will become clear when I go back to the actual screen. I'll show you how we slice and dice the data. Uh, for, for impact analysis and for understanding how we keep these things up to date. But we do need to describe the purpose of it. Generally speaking, we want to have drop downs and tick boxes, if you like, where we can select where things are. Um, we, we are, as you know, updating the third parties. So, for example, as we go through this, we are indicating uh, where, uh, what third parties are being used. This is a list of all of our third parties that we have on this test account. And for this third party, we also select whether they are a data controller or data processor. If, for example, we select our data processor, the, uh, the option to attach a data processor agreement will be right here in the actual record of processing activity, which is very useful. Uh, if we don't do that, of course, this will suggest a risk to us here in the risk uh, red register when I, I'll come down to that now in a few minutes and I'll show you how that works as well. Similarly, we want to identify any transfers abroad. Again, adding that is fairly straightforward. Click on this, and let's say it is going to the United uh, States. Let's say we click on that, and then we select the transfer mechanism. And if we don't, if, let's well, we can't select that now. Uh, let's say standard contractual clauses. And uh, we have another risk suggestion here based on what we have actually entered. Again, we're building this profile as we go. We come down to the data section, and here we want to identify um, what type of data. Uh, is actually processed in this particular record of processing activity. We, we very often get asked the question, how far do we go in relation to the detail of the ROPAs? 
and we draw the line here. So in terms of we want to be able to identify the different types, we don't necessarily need to identify if it's like email, name, phone number. We want to know the categories. That's generally sufficient in terms of where we want to go. And there's obviously sort of what you might call regular personal data, but there's also special category data. So if, for example, we selected from this particular record, there's political opinions, I select that. And under the GDPR, we must have one of these reasons for actually processing this data. If we don't, it's going to suggest another risk. Uh, and then we start to build up the risk profile of this uh, record, but also this, this bundle of records as it sits within its hierarchy. Um, you'll notice as we go through this that we start, we start to collect a huge amount of very relevant information. One of the things that comes up is actually how long should we keep this information for and how long should we retain the information. So um, getting the answer to this question is no trivial task at all. What I'm going to do here is I'm just going to show you how we would go about doing that within the context uh, of the retention information. So, um, you know, because of the way data protection is, the legislation is actually drafted, you actually must go and determine or, or, or analyze all of the regulation in any one particular jurisdiction. So in this context, we're looking at, uh, we are looking at, uh, we're looking at the Irish context and we're looking at HO records. So if I look at uh, human resources uh, records in Ireland alone, there is 151 references and pieces of legislation as to how long we must keep data for. And we need to know what this is in order to set the actual retention period as well. And you can drill right down so you can actually get to the exact reference uh, of that as well, uh, where it's relevant. So I'm gonna just shut this back down, and go back to the records, so I can see that now. So the retention information, it will generate a, a risk suggestion here if we don't do this, <clears throat> and we can then manage this later on as well. Uh, we also, so moving on in terms of the other pieces of information that we want to actually um, uh, capture here, it's important again that we understand how information is acquired. So for example, sometimes it could be in this by email or, or, or by another acquisition method. If in this context, we want to be able to determine has fair notice been provided or not. If we're say we're not sure, for example, we click on that, we're going to have another risk suggestion as well. So as we go through, we start to build up this profile. We want to understand the categories of data subjects and the IT systems. Uh, in this context, you know, these risks are associated with these particular IT systems that are part of this record of processing activity. I can add a new IT system, or I can drill down and have a look at one of, one of these, this learning management system here in this particular. Uh, in this particular ROPA. We know it's in the cloud. We can see, for example, that it's, we don't know whether it's encrypted, whether there's failover and only some security. Again, we're building this picture as we go in terms of how we're processing information within the organization. And then uh, uh, second to last is uh, the policies. So we do recommend that we understand the policies that are related within each section. Now, this doesn't have to be on each ROPA level, but it could be on a sort of high level ROPA. And we want to check if it's in force. So there's one thing being having a policy that's in line with best practice. It's another thing to have a policy that's actually enforced as well. So we do check for that. And then finally, we get down to the risk suggestions. Some of these will become risks that we will want uh, to uh, activate, if you like, and put them on our risk register. Some of these we, we think aren't relevant and we do not want to put them on our risk register as well. So, but having the risks suggested to you is really quite critical as we start to build out these particular ropes as well. All right, so I'm gonna go back now to uh, the actual um, the table and I won't save anything there, I'm just gonna let me share my screen here so I can click on a few things. Um, so now we're at the point where, you know, we have filled out the ropes in our sort of journey here and we used uh, individuals throughout the organization to help do that. The next sort of task here is being able to use these for, for benefit, really, in terms of impact analysis and in terms of understanding the risk. Now, I have a slide later on which I'll show real quick in terms of some of the recommendations that we've got from the Commissioner's Office around robots. But I think one of the things that's becoming abundantly clear is that, yeah, it needs to be easy to put together in terms of the robots and we provide as much assistance as we can in that, but also easy to understand and we cater for that in terms of how we actually structure the data. But critically, this has to be a living document of sorts, even though it's on a platform here. What I mean by that is that the risks are managed and monitored 
uh, as we go through as we go through our sort of day to day uh, tasks and, and it becomes a business as usual function. We do not want to see what we don't recommend is that the ropes are completed as a one off piece of activity and then uh, they're never looked at again. So being able to slice and dice the data, being able to analyze it in a, in, a, in a very intelligible way is really critical for this to be effective. Um, so what I'll say in this regard here, I'll just look at the filters, for example. So if I bring out this filter panel here, what you'll see here is that because we captured and stored the information in a very, very structured way, we can now slice and dice the data by a huge amount of different types of categories. So for example, we may want to slice and dice it by acquisition method or we may want to actually say, show me all of the ropes whereby we have, uh, you know, that are involved with current employees uh, or that are involved with profiling. The list here is quite, um, quite comprehensive and we can create filters and views of the world that have multiple different sorts of considerations associated with it. So just as an example, let's suppose we wanted to say, uh, let's have a look at all of the ropes which uh, have a lawful basis of consent and explicit consent. And we think that that's important and relevant to us. I can see there's a, uh, there's a couple of questions coming in. I will get to those now very shortly uh, within time. So just to make this point here, like because of the amount of guidance that we get, um, as in all of us would, would receive from things like European Data Protection Board or regulators across Europe and beyond, they will often come out with advice on explicit consent, on consent, and we may want to quickly identify where we are uh, processing uh, uh, that data and what record of processing we're actually using for that. And again, you know, Privacy Engine is, is very much a complete system. Everything sort of works in unison. The way that we recommend you do this is we would actually screen all of the guidance from all of the regulators in close to real time so that we can see if there is any new advice on that. So what I'll do is I'll say, let me just punch in here. Let's say we want to uh, analyze, let's say anything that's come, anything that references uh, consent or let's say explicit consent. And anything that comes from, let's say, a regulator uh, within the last uh, 12 months. So what's happening here now is that Privacy Engine, through, through Privacy Pulse, one of our latest sort of products, is, is analyzing all the information on all of the regulators globally. It's capturing all that, it's profiling it. It's doing some quite clever uh, natural language processing on it to determine if there's anything relevant from any of these. So it's quite a lot. So even the last 12 months is over three and a half thousand records. So let's say we're interested in just looking at what's come back from the ICO on that. So if I click on this here, that'll shorten the actual. So over the last 12 months, 180, which is quite a lot. We can see the most recent one here came in 28th of June. And the algorithm determines if there's something in there relating to consent or explicit consent that's actually relevant. You can drill down, in fact, into these and actually go straight to the source of the documents, in this case, it's a, it's a policy document, or if you wanted to go, uh, in fact, to the ICO's website reference to it, you click on that and you go straight to it. But again, it's having access to that. If that's something that we want to be notified of, anytime anything changes, we save it as a channel. And then we give it a name that's relevant to us, and we say, send me an alert. So what will happen in this instance is, anytime there's something, this particular example, from the UK, from the UK regulator, it's relevant to consent or explicit consent. You'll get an email the next day linking you back to the source of that, and that might actually bring us back to the point where, uh, on the on our ropes, we may want to actually alter or or do something different with how we're processing it, uh, and it's a great way of actually keeping these up to date and making sure that we're actively looking at it as well. Um, I'll make one last uh, point on this, and this is more to do with the practicalities of managing your ropes in real time. Um, this is a really important point, I think, because uh, we want to avoid a one and done type of approach with, with the record of processing activity. We want to actually review them. We review data fairly shortly on it, but anytime something new comes up, we really wanna be in a position where we can show the risks associated with our records of processing activity going down over time. So the way we do that, it would be on our risk register. 
And you can see there's a two dimensional risk score here. But again, let's say we wanted to say, show me all of the risks that are just related to the records of processing activity. Well, we can do that. And we can see here that in this instance, there's 63 risks. And I can pull down and get a view of that as well. But critically, you may want to say, where were we on this a year ago? So if I go back to, let's say, 1st of June, and keep in mind, I'm adding risks more often than not than removing them. You'll see the, cha the change in profile for that is only three in the difference. But critically, you'll be able to show a point in time risks that were identified and classified as risks in your risk register through the records of processing activity. How have they been, how have they moved on over, in this instance, a year period as well? And I would say that if this is relevant, we would save that as a filter and we can get notified of these particular changes as well. In a similar way, we have one risk but of multiple actions. And again, we may want to, for example, say, show me all of the actions that are associated with records of processing activity that are due within the next year, within the next week or month or whatever the action is that are of a severity of high and are involved in a particular department or whatever the case is. So the, the message I'm trying to get across here is in, in order to have an effective privacy program and to have this effective, uh, have an effective ROPA program, if you like, we need to involve the other, we need to involve people within the organization, activate them as DP champions, and also make it very, very easy for them to understand what it is they have to do, any risks that were identified when completing the ROPA, and when we will actually uh, and, and, and monitor the, the actions that we're putting in place to remove those risks and be able to demonstrate that. So it, it's linking it all together. It's not just having it in an Excel sheet is, 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 is one very basic way of trying to do it, putting it in the system that will help manage the workflow, identify the actual risks and make it easy for DP champions and for the entire privacy team to actually understand how these risks are being mitigated over time as well. So it feeds into a lot of the wider program actually doing the, the rope is hence why it's a cornerstone in much respects of, um, of, a, of, a, of a privacy program. Okay, so um, sort of demo part of it sort of over. I know I covered a lot of ground there, but I think it's, it's relevant um, to uh, the messages I think uh, uh, we, we need, to, um, need to communicate based on what we see as sort of best practice in this area as well. Um, all right, okay, so um, I, I did promise that we would have a slide on guidance from the DPC. So again, this is uh, what we're getting. The, we've cleared it, obviously, with the DPC that we can share this information, of course. Um, so these, although the report isn't finalized, um, it'll be along the lines of this, uh, that message, or there could be tweets to it, but this is the, this is the latest um, that, that we have from them. So uh, ROPAS is a tool for an organization to map and identify the personal data processing self-evident um they, they they strongly recommend it's a live document that goes back to some of the things that we were saying earlier in terms of making sure that it's uh there are identifiable risks identifiable actions are signed out properly and it's easy to manage so that we can make those uh, actions or action those uh, risks to mitigate them uh, this is something that's been stressed quite a bit a readable and decipherable format for the dpc so again in our view, we will interpret that as putting this into a very logical hierarchy so that you can clearly see the information that's there, clearly see the risks associated with it as well. Uh, they have reviewed a, a lot of ROPAs and in general, um, they would like more granularity than the ROPAs that they have seen from the people that they have seen it from. That's what they're, they're saying uh, at the moment. Uh, and a, a word of warning, I suppose, an entry for each process is expected, not just for each business unit. Um, that should be somewhat self-evident, but just having one ROPA per business unit uh, clearly doesn't describe the activity that goes on within any one organization or with any one department. Uh, so just bear that in mind, building out a little more comprehensive uh, logs, it would be required there. And obviously they must be getting this from, from uh, some individuals or some organizations. Uh, DPIAs does not equal a ROPA. So, um, they, they might have they might have got that uh, from, from a couple of organizations and again stressing the point that we said right off the bat rope is um, not required for organizations less than 250 employees uh, best practice would be to do it uh, for sure and uh, it, it for, for a whole lot of obvious enough reasons um, but uh, it, it helps you drive your your privacy program uh, in, in a structure that that, that helps everybody 
Uh, so it, well recommended, I would say as well. Okay, so I'm just going to give it over here just to my, my sort of uh, second screen here. I'm just going to go through some some questions uh, that we have. Um, all right, okay. Um, I, so the question, what format would you recommend if it was not Excel sheet? I mean, I would, that's not going to surprise anybody. I would recommend using Privacy Engine uh, for doing it for sure. Um, but, but almost any tool would be better than Excel. Uh, so even if it wasn't Privacy Engine, really any privacy management platform would, would be the way to go. Clearly, uh, I'm biased in my view. I would think uh, that the Privacy Engine would be best in class by quite a margin. Uh, how can processing activities be exported for an external uh, party? So um, that's a really good question. We On Privacy Engine, we have an export function. Uh, to actually do that. Uh, in certain circumstances, uh, organizations have actually provided access for the DPC directly onto Privacy Engine so they can see the robots. Uh, that actually works really well as well. We've seen both. Um, we've been seen both approaches there as well. But everything in Privacy Engine is actually exportable to Excel, uh, but it becomes very difficult to manage if you're just using Excel on it. And it's, uh, so, um, can, we, can you mention key differences to, to one trust. Uh, all right, so uh, I, I, one overriding difference I would say is that ours is fully integrated with the entire platform. That is unique um, in the sense that everything on Privacy Engine is built with every other feature of Privacy Engine built in. Uh, that, 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 is, that is unique. There, there's perhaps that's a nuanced point, but it means that your, your risks are very easily accessible on your risk register. It links in with, with your DPIA uh, and it, it works as a very um, cohesive single system that helps drive the program forward. The other, I would say massive difference to be honest is that uh, we are DPOs for organizations as well. So whereas we are a product company with Privacy Engine, we have a consultancy arm to our business and we act as a data protection officer for many, many organizations. And it's that combination of not just the technology, but the technology, the experience, and the expertise of how this really does work in practice gives us, uh, uh, it basically gives us a, quite a strong advantage. I honestly don't know of another organization that has their own platform like we do and their own DPO as a service and consultancy arm on top of it as well. So that, that's a key difference. Um, okay, so. Just, there's, there's a fair amount of questions coming through here. Uh, can Privacy Engine assist with going through or open? We certainly can. Um, you know, because, and again, that probably leads into the question uh, that we had uh, prior to that, or rather the answer to the question we had prior to that. We can do all of this for you, it, it, or we can provide consultancy services to actually help you do it. We do for large organizations, actually. We, we've got several, um, sort of exclusively ROPA engagements where we work with organizations to help them complete the ROPAs. Uh, we also uh, take what they have in Excel and use that as a starting point for uploading into Privacy Engine. And we do that as an onboarding process. There's no automated way to do that because everybody's done it slightly differently, but we have our own internal processes for taking what you've already done and putting it up on Privacy Engine as a starting point and then putting a bit of um, structure to it in terms of hierarchy and going from going from there as well. And let me just pull up uh, these questions here. Uh, so, um, uh, okay, so trying to get through these here. Um, how do you add sub logs? Uh, okay, so there's basically, you can bundle and you can add a, a sub log or the question here is how do we add sub logs? On each log, you, you basically point to the parent uh, log. So that's one way of doing it. But you can also copy them. And a lot of organizations build in sort of maps of their processing hierarchy and they copy it for different sections that it's relevant for it. So it's very, very flexible in that regard. Um, can you share with us uh, PDF guidelines and examples to fill these logs? Yes, we actually have template logs as well, which we're currently building out, uh, which uh, would be useful for many organizations. Um, so there's a question there, the difference between a DPIA versus a ROPA. So a ROPA is a very specific description of uh, how you're processing personal data within your entire organization. 
And a DPIA is a, is a specific, almost individually focused piece of work to determine the risk from generally, hopefully, a proposed process that you're actually uh, going to roll out in the future. And of course, there's best practice in both of them. Uh, and they're very, very different in that regard. So they're two distinct, separate uh, area processes, really. Uh, okay, so many larger companies do not have a data processor agreement, but rely on terms of service and said, is it possible to capture some privacy engine? Yes, it is. And in fact, um, you know, a lot of the really big organizations, for example, such as like Microsoft, they would have binding corporate rules. And of course, you, you could upload the binding corporate rules as well in certain circumstances. The degree of risk in terms of your third parties really depends on many, many things. It's very often though, the, the SME, top end of the SME, organizations, very small enterprises, if you wanted to classify them as that, are very often the higher risk because uh, they, they and, and rather than um, the very large organizations like the Microsoft who would have gone through things like buying corporate rules as well. In that type of scenario where we would be leveraging a third party that was processing, let's say, high volumes of personal data, uh, I would always recommend assessing them um, using um, the third party, uh, the third party uh, assessment functionality on privacy engine as well. Um, how long does it take a member of staff, uh, the process uh, owner, say, to become comfortable using Pat Well, we have a we have a we have a full onboarding uh, procedure for for new uh, people and for new staff and new companies to actually get on board to use it. It's very, very user friendly in the sense that um, there's a lot of help all over the place. There's always that big red button if you need more help, but there's a lot of video tutorials on how to do things in best practice as well. Keep in mind, Privacy Engine has a fully baked learning management system contained within the platform. So that can be used as well to actually train staff on, on how to do it as well. Uh, so lots of questions coming in. Um, so uh, it's, let me just read this out. Uh, when a data subject wants to know what all of the categories of data the organizations hold on them, can you send them a ROPA report? Uh, I don't know if I'd recommend doing it that way um, for subject access requests. I'd need to think about that in terms of sending them a ROPA report. Um, there would be and likely sensitive information that you would very much need to redact in that sense. Plus, generally with a, the subject access requests they're looking for the specifics of it rather than just the category of it as well so uh my first in, initial reaction to that would be probably not but honestly i'd need to think about that one a little a little more um can i show okay so there's a couple of people have show some of so i've got a, i've got a question here that's come up several times so let me just uh share my screen again and i'll just show this because people are asking for uh, how I add a sub log. So let's say in HR, for example, there's two ways that I would recommend that we can do this. There's actually several ways to add it. One of the simplest ways is actually just building out, for example, duplicating a log here. So let's say I wanted to create a log right here. I could duplicate it by creating this, and then it would create a copy of it, which so, some of the information would be relevant. So it's probably a good starting point for doing it that way. You might want to change the name. So let's say it's training um, new hires, let's say. Uh, okay, and then really where we sit here, it's the associated activity. So I can point this at any one of my processing activities here. So at the moment I'm pointing it at 2.5 training staff. If I wanted to raise it up, I could, like, or, or, or drill down, I could select where its parent uh, log is and leave it at that way. Uh, and then you just go right down to the bottom and click save. Um, and there's, a f there's, there's quite a few ways to actually add uh, these logs uh, or, or create new sub logs to uh, the records of processing activity. So if I go back here, you'll see now if I drill down, there will be a, uh, another one here, training new hires as well. And let's say I could actually, I could duplicate that entire uh, branch, the tree, if you wanted to. And you could uh, you could click here. I can add a sub activity, uh, which would add a blank one right in here. And I can do it this way. So hopefully that, that, answers, uh, that answers that particular question. Um, okay, 
Now, let me just go right back. I know we are very much up against it here in terms of time. Uh, let me just quickly go. I think I have answered most questions. 